if you look at like last several years, maybe uh, uh, seven, eight years back, it was really hard to convince the upper management of a company the need for an identity access management system. It was really hard to convince the return on investment. Maybe like a, a company like uh, having more than 10,000 employees, so that may be the case. But most of us, it's not the case, right? But uh, last few years, we have seen a trend, like people try to have an IAM system built into their company. But it's not the same like the level of expectation we have, but it's, there's a good progress. Even here, we can see like it's just 30% of you have an identity access management system in your company, right? So one reason is over the past, the entry barrier has gone down. And also the ROI of, the, of an IAM system has gone up. People are moving away from like bulky, uh, costly IAM systems like Oracle, IBM, to open source options and also cloud-based solutions. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the end-to-end -end, uh, IAM uh, lifecycle management of an user identity. Right? And also how the, the applicability of the identity server in all these phases. And I welcome questions at any point. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. So we'll be talking about uh, all this stuff. Uh, so let me start with onboarding. Right? So Dimutu uh, uh, talked a little bit about uh, like uh, the various forms of uh, the, the patterns of onboarding users. Right, uh, so so there's a clear differentiation between employee onboarding and custom onboarding. Sagar will be doing the next talk. We'll talk about CIAM, the custom onboarding process, and the best practices you need to follow. If it is employee onboarding, it will start from your HR system. Right, your your HR department will own or initiate the employee onboarding thing. So you get the CV, you interview the guy. If it's all fine. At the point you decide to recruit that guy, you will inform your IT admin. So the IT admin will create an account, and it, will may, it may send a mail uh, to that particular person's personal email. Then you click on that link, reset the password, you are in. Right? So that's, that's a common pattern, and people really don't worry about, like, uh, uh, about the user experience of employee onboarding. But when it comes to customer onboarding, there are multiple patterns. Self-sign-up is the most common pattern. Self-sign-up can be done in multiple ways. Just, the, just go to a site, uh, fill everything there, and just sign up. The other pattern is you use a, a social IDP. Like If you already have a social IDP, you just uh, log in with that, and the, the, your local IDP will fetch attributes from the social IDP, and your account will be automatically created you only need to give a minimal set of attributes there. And also, another pattern uh, uh, Dimutu explained, self sign up with verification, right? You sell an insurance policy offline, or anything offline to someone, and then you keep that record in your, let's say, Salesforce, right? So you have the policy number and other details of that particular user in Salesforce. Then this guy comes back and won't sign up through your online portal. Then he needs to enter all this information back, policy number, first name, last name, maybe they system like that. Then, it, then this particular, uh, the online portal will talk to an API, and then API needs to talk to different systems. It may be a, a database that you have, it may be Salesforce or any other CRM system. You talk to that, verify the information entered by the user. If it's all fine, then you create a record for that particular user. That's the one pattern. Then the other one is uh, approval workflows. So this is a feature we have introduced since Identity Server 5.1.0. You can define multi-layer approval phases. Right? You can say, if you want to onboard a user, first you need to get the approval from role foo or role bar, anyone in role foo or role bar. And if it's all fine, then go to next step. Next step. You need to get the approval from Peter, John, or from anyone in role C. Like that, to the level you want, you can define multi-level approval flows. And to get done all this stuff, we have a set of APIs. So most of the APIs 
uh, are in uh, SOAP at the moment, but for this particular uh, functionalities, we have REST APIs too. And then again, in our roadmap with Identity Server uh, 5, 5 yo, so don't, don't uh, rely on the version number. Uh, version number may change, but anyhow, by like Q2 next year, we plan to make all our APIs RESTful. So you will have a clean RESTful API to do all this stuff, right? So you can integrate with the user portal likewise. If you go to even go to AAA Life, so that's the insurance provider uh, we were talking about. Uh, all the sign-up operations, authentication operations, account recovery operations, all are linked to the identity service APIs. Right? So that's that's a very common use case. It's like people rely uh, mostly they don't use our UIs, so they integrate with the identity server with the APIs. Provisioning. Right? So provisioning goes hand in hand with uh, onboarding operation. So you, you create an account for that particular user in your corporate LDAP or the user store. That's not just enough. You need to provision this user to the connected systems. These systems can be Salesforce. And you don't need to provision everyone to Salesforce, right? You only need to provision if the particular employee in your sales team to Salesforce. So that's the conditional provisioning. In Identity Server, you can define policies or rules to decide on which criteria you need to outbound provision users. And if you take, if you, if you have uh, Google Apps, if you're using Google Apps in your company, you may need to provision everyone to Google Apps, right? So you can have one policy, everyone will be in Google Apps, but only the sales team will be in Salesforce, right? And right now with IS5, we had only even 530 shipped out of the box with scheme 1.1. One, one. Scheme 2.0 is the latest version of it. So with IS530, we, we have a connector, which is in our connector store. You can download and install it and get the scheme 2.0 support. But it's only inbound, right? So if you are familiar with identity server, you may know we have inbound and outbound too. So inbound means if you have an application, you can collect users' information and provision the user to identity server using the scheme API. Right? So that we support is scheme one and scheme two are both. Outbound means you provision the user to identity server, then identity server can provision to external systems, Salesforce, Google Labs, or any other system. Right? So for that, we don't have a scheme connector yet, but we are working on that. Right? SSO and identity federation. So now you are in the company uh, corporate LDAP, and you've been provisioned to all the other connected systems. Now you can access them. So now your corporate IDP can federate your identity to the connected systems. You can log into Salesforce with your corporate IDP. You can log into Google Labs with your corporate IDP. So both those uh, uh, SaaS applications are using SAML 2.0. And you can also log into Office 365, which is using WS Federation Passive Profile through the IDP. And you only need to log in once. Right? So identity server centrally manages your session under its own domain, and you can log into all these other applications. And you may have uh, uh, on-prem app application uh, running, supporting OpenID Connect. So we do support that too. And we also support CAS. So CAS is a very popular standard among universities. I haven't seen like many enterprises using it. So uh, thanks to the, the open source nature of our product, one of our clients developed the CAS support for identity server and contributed it back to us. If you look at, like, uh, there are more than uh, 100 plus universities in USA and Canada using identity server for the CAS support, right? And then again, we introduced this conditional authentication feature in identity server 530. Right? So if you look at the way the authorization happens, so most of the time, authorization happens at the application end, right? So you want to log into Salesforce, Salesforce will redirect you to the IDP, you log in there, and you send a token to Salesforce. Then the Salesforce side itself will authorize you, it will check whether you have the permissions in Salesforce. That is the reason why we need to provision the user, right, first place. So we provision the user with set of roles from the Salesforce 
then when you look into Salesforce, Salesforce knows what roles this particular user has there, and according to those roles, you can perform on Salesforce, right? So, so that means the authorization side is done at the application end. What we have done with conditional authentication is we also give you another layer of authorization that you can do at the IDP end, right? Extra level of protection. You can say, so it's a policy-based thing, you, and it come, we, we ship a set of templates too. You can say, only the sales team people can log into Salesforce. And also you can say, only the IT admin can log into the uh, IT portal or IT admin portal during a weekday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. only from an internal IP address. To that level, you can define policies in identity server. Another important aspect here is, so we have worked with many customers who, who, who want to use identity server for migration. So migration in the sense, so they have, they have large IT systems with many number of departments. Right, so one company we worked with, so they had like about 200 departments, very large organization. So when you have many departments, each department has their own user store, right? So that means a given employee could be in multiple user stores with different names and different passwords. And each department has their own application too, right? So HR department has their own applications, engineering department has their own applications likewise. And the way they want to work, work these applications is only the users from HR user store should be able to log into the HR application like that. So when we try to build a unified identity platform across all these departments, first we need to connect all these user stores to a central identity server. So identity server can connect to multiple user stores running on LDAP, uh, any database, or an active directory. Then we can connect all these applications to the identity server using any of these identity federation protocols. Now with this conditional authentication capabilities, we can say, we can define a policy, HR application, which is a service providing identity server now, will only let users log into it through HR user store. So those policies can also be uh, uh, present in, present, can, can be done with conditional authentication. And also, we want to discuss to some extent uh, our capabilities as an identity bus. We can do that too. So it's not just straightforward thing. It's not just getting an OAuth token from Facebook and convert it to a SAML token and send, to, uh, send it to Salesforce. You need to do role mapping stuff, claim mapping stuff to support more complex use cases. So we'll be doing set of demos tomorrow. Uh, afternoon, so if you're interested, please join. Then authentication, right? So authentication is decoupled from all these federation standards. SAML, OpenID Connect, WS Federation, OpenID, CAS, none of these standards define how to authenticate the user. They define how to transport user identities, user, user attributes, authentication assertions, authorization assertions, from one point to another point. They don't talk about how to authenticate the user. So once you are on the IDP, you can authenticate with any number of ways. So we do support authentication with username and password, connect to an LDAP, database on Active Directory, and also we do support multi-factor authentication. We support FIDO U2F. How many of you have heard of FIDO? Okay, so FIDO is going to be the de, de facto standard for multi-factor authentication. So if you look at Google, so all the Google employees internally to authenticate with internal applications, they are using FIDO. All the LinkedIn employees internally, they use FIDO. Even Google today, your Gmail, you can secure instead of your phone, you can have FIDO device from second factor, as a second factor. Facebook has a FIDO support too. So this is going to be the de facto standard for multi-factor authentication in the future, and we do support that too. And then again, we support uh, uh, OTP or SMS, an email, then TOTP. If you use Google Authenticator app, then you can integrate that with Identity Server that it is using the TOTP standard. Right? Okay. 
Okay, so next one is authorization. What's going on? Okay, so authorization can be done either role based or attribute based. So we talked about talked a little about authorization uh, when it comes to conditional authentication. So we, you can integrate an authorization policies into the login flow itself. In addition to that. If you want to delegate your authorization logic to the identity server, where identity server could act as a policy decision point, then you can do that too. So we do support SACML out of the box. So once again, when it comes to SACML, it has multiple components, right? SACML policy is one thing, where you need to write it in XML, in the SACML policy language. Then it has a SACML REST API, right? So uh, this is, this is, an, this is a, uh, a different specification comes under OSIS. It defines a JSON REST profile for SACML. You don't need to be XML anymore. It's JSON REST profile. So we do support that too. So you can just question the identity server saying, can this particular user uh, do this particular action on this resource in a JSON payload in a completely restful manner, then identity server will res respond back. So then again, to address, to cater this request, you don't need to maintain all the policies in SACML, right? So those are two decoupled things. You can have you can have your database to represent your access control logic and standardize the interface between your application and the, the PDP with SACML JSON profile. So we do support all this stuff. Okay. Then the self-service aspect is another important thing. So now like uh, you onboarded. You, you, uh, you've been provisioned to all the other applications. Now you can log in, you're authorized. Now you need to do other stuff, right? So you need to change your, change your password. You need to uh, attach different uh, uh, second factor devices. Then you can do that with user portal. And uh, even with IS530, we have a dashboard. That's our user portal. But with IS550, hopefully by Q2 next year, so we are going to redesign our UIs. Both the admin portal and the UI portal will get changed. It will be more like if you are familiar with uh, API store and publisher, so it will have the same kind of look and feel. Right? So password reset and self-access request. So, so that means like uh, uh, you, your company has a set of applications. right? So your company has subset of Salesforce, Google Apps, Concurve, many other applications. But you may not have access to all those applications at first place. Right? So if you want to access Salesforce, rather than go and ask from someone, you can initiate a self-access request from the user portal itself. Then we can initiate a workflow. We can automate everything. Right? So we can initiate a workflow. If, if the request can be addressed, catered automatically, we can do that based on certain parameters. If not, if we need some human involvement, then we'll send messages to the corresponding parties. And once they approve, then you will get access to that particular application. Then profile update, password reset, account recovery, those stuff we talked about. The another important thing is consent management. So this is an important aspect in GDPR. Right. So I'll be talking more about GDPR uh, on Wednesday. So if you are free, please join that meetup to open meet up, like you don't need to register for WC2Con. If you have any friends, ask them to come too. So consent management is an important aspect in GDPR. So we are going to build a consent management portal where you can specify, like if you want to revoke a given consent, you can revoke it. And if you want to change the time, like when you give a consent, you should be able to uh, limit it by time, right? limit it by purpose, and also view what's happening to your consent. So those stuff you can do through the consent management portal. One thing I missed here, one important thing in the previous slide, the authentication slide. Right? So right now, we do support uh, multi-step authentication and multi-option authentication. Right? So multi-option authentication means if your application needs uh, users to be authenticated either from Twitter, uh, Yahoo, or Facebook, then that's multiple options, right? You can just configure that in the identity server. So once user get redirected to the identity server through that particular service provider, identity server will display uh, those options, right? So multi-step authentication is 
uh, in multi option authentication it's a o between authenticators multi uh, multi step authentication means it's an and each step you need to authenticate and you can make the multi step authentication into a multi factor authentication flow by picking the right authenticators in each step right so now this flow in identity server 530 is static right so there are workarounds to make it dynamic but still it's static so whenever you define you, you define a flow for a service provider if 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 user wants to log into salesforce you can say just authenticate it username and password if user wants to log into amazon <coughs> then authenticate the user with username and password plus fido like that it's per service provider static flow it's not dynamic so important change we are working on for is 550 to support adaptive authentication through policies right so rather than like uh, uh, if you have a custom requirement then you need to write some java code so some, if you have user identity server you may know like if you want to change the flow then you need to write an authenticator in java so with is 550 we let you write those stuff in javascript in the management console itself in the portal itself so in the console you can say if the request comes from internal ip then just use username and password if it comes from external ip then use username and password plus the fido and you may also say if if the users uh, role is uh, admin then use multi factor authentication for the rest just use username and password so likewise you can define very complex uh, uh, solutions in a very simple uh, in a programmatic model okay so monitoring and analytics is another very important aspect so we do support login analytics session analytics and fraud detection stuff so login analytics you can find how many users logged in the system successful attempts uh, failed attempts by service provider and also by idp session analytics is a useful feature <coughs> in capacity planning you can find out how many users in the system at a given moment and also across the the time right active sessions and also for a given user you can find out the 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 variation of sessions so these these features already available in identity server and in future next year we'll put in more weight on identity analytics finally deprovisioning or offboarding so this is once again part of the provisioning right so we have the pro outbound provisioning connectors just like you did uh, uh, provisioning you can outbound provisioning provision users too so so we have done some uh, i think we have two moments right done okay so uh, so let me share some interesting use cases right if you using salesforce you know that you pay by number of users right even in google labs you pay by number of users so we had a customer right so they 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 wanted to expose their google docs and other stuff to their partners right so what happens was so they 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 introduce identity server as a trusted idp to their google labs account so whenever somebody wants to access that particular google labs account they will get rid of identity server and they introduce their partner as a trusted idp to identity server i think the question may be you ask right so when an employee from that particular partner comes to the comes to the google labs he will get rid of this the the home idp then there he can find a link to its own idp right so you first get redirected to trusted idp of the google labs domain then you get redirected to the user's home idp then there you authenticate come back with a saml response the identity server will send the user back to the google labs if we just do that login will authentication part will pass but the authorization will fail because that particular user from the partner idp is not provisioned into google labs right the authorization check will fail to fix that what we can do is when you get the response from the partner idp to your idp our own idp before we send back the response authentication response to google labs in the blocking mode we can provision this user to google labs right so now user is provision when you get there with the saml token everything is set up but the issue here is when there are many number of users in the partners you need to pay for all those users because we provision all these users how to fix that 
When you single log out from Google Labs, you come to the identity server. Right? So you can enable single logout. So when you enable single logout, you give a single logout URL. So you get redirected back to the identity server. And at that point, we can deprovision the user. Right? So you, then you don't need to pay for any number of users. Yes, so I think that uh, concludes my talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, so it's a request, right? Uh, you are sending a feature request to. Uh, oh, it was just I, I didn't know if there was a way. Of okay. Right now, right now we don't. We, but only thing we have is you can find out when user logs in from which service providers you to to which service providers user has logged in. For a given service provider, you can find out all the users who have logged into this particular service provider. Yeah, so that feature is already there. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. You said uh, identity server 5.5 will s solve almost everything. Yes. So when will it come? You said next year. Next year has next 12 year, months. Next year, Q2. Q2. Probably Q2, yes. OK. But anyway, like uh, uh, features later to, uh, to do GDPR, Right, so we'll push them as one updates on top of IS 5.4.0. So IS 5.4.0 will get released by before end of this year, and on top of that, we are uh, giving one updates. Yeah. So we are doing a detailed session tomorrow. Maybe if you have any questions, we can uh, talk them tomorrow. So I'll introduce the next speaker. So next speaker is Sagar uh, Gunatunga. Uh, he joined WSO2 in 2011, and uh, he is the VP of uh, Apache Web Services Project. And he also led uh, WSO2 governance registry and application server. And now he's in the identity server leadership team. And Sagar is going to talk about uh, GDPR and its applicability in customer identity access management. Audio Sagar.